Yeah, but I think concertos are a good way to bring different worlds together because you can bring not just like the faculty in with the students, but like professionals in with non-professionals. And um, in the case with like my percussion quartet concerto, like um, taking like percussion quartet, which normally exists in the new music chamber, new music world and bringing it to the band world. Uh, I think it's really exciting. And I have plans for a new, another concerto with band that I feel like I can't really say anything about yet, but it's very exciting taking new music, bringing the new music, chamber music world together with the band world, which is something I'm seeing more and more of, like just the the dinner we were at Midwest, just like the new music USA, how that's become a fixture at Midwest is really exciting. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I really appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now on to my next guest, composer Viet Quang. Hi Viet, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. So Viet, can you tell the listeners about yourself and what you do? Yeah, um, I'm a composer based in Philadelphia, and um, I've been composing a long time. And I uh, kind of grew up in the band world, so I continue to be a part of it. And I enjoy writing for band as well as um, other things that I've done over my career now. So Viet, can you tell the listeners, now I know where you went to high school, so I know why you say you grew up in the band world, but can you tell the listeners about your early background and uh, how you got into music, what instrument you play, etc.? Yeah, uh, so my first instrument was actually piano, so that wasn't a band instrument, obviously, but I started piano when I was like five, I want to say, because um, my, my mom is an engineer, my dad's a geophysicist, and course the uh, parents like that want a smart kid right so <laughs> um my mom wrote it read about the mozart effect and how learning classical music could make my brain function better i guess so she enrolled me in suzuki piano lessons and i really didn't take to that very much because i remember in suzuki they wanted me to play like light lero until i really like mastered it and <laughs> like twinkle twinkle little star like and all I really wanted to play were like Disney songs <laughs> on the piano. Like I wanted to play like Be Your Guest and Part of Your World. Um, and they wouldn't let me do that. So I wasn't really into it. And I didn't like practicing what I didn't want to play. Um, so I think I only did that for a little while. But then um, when we moved to Georgia, when I was around seven or eight, um, I somehow had interest in playing piano again. I don't know why, but... I asked if I could take piano lessons and my mom said, oh yeah, sure, want to try it again? <laughs> we have practice this time. So basically we signed up with a teacher who wasn't a Suzuki teacher and she let me play what I wanted to play. And so I did like playing more, but I still didn't like to practice much, but I really loved to make things up at the piano and kind of, I guess you could call it improvisation. That's not how I thought of it at the time. Um, but I would just make things up on the piano all the time and then when I got to sixth grade, we had to, or we didn't have to join band, but I wanted to join band because that's what everyone was doing. Um, and I remember the band director asked, like, who here plays piano? And then I raised my hand and they're like, okay, you're going to play percussion. Because <laughs> <laughs> then I wouldn't have to learn where all the notes were, obviously. Um, so I was a percussionist and um, I always liked playing mallet instruments more, actually, because I think... Um, 
I kind of had a an edge over like everyone else in terms of not having to learn how to read music or where the notes were. Um, so it just was very natural for me. Um, and then I remember I went to this like middle school band camp that was held at Lassiter because it was basically like a recruiting thing. And one of the um, band directors at Lassiter, Catherine Sinan Bushman, did like a little seminar on Finale Notepad. And I was like, this is what I've always needed because I have all this, I have all this stuff that I've made up on the piano. And I have no way of writing it down. Um, even though obviously I could have written it down with staff paper, but I just, I was too lazy or it didn't seem right to me. I guess I'm the generation where like handwritten stuff is doesn't seem right to me. I don't know. Um, I was like, oh my gosh, Finale Notepad. And then I went home and downloaded it. And um, I think back then you could only have like up to 10 staves or something, but I like put in a flute and clarinet and like a trumpet and like basically taught myself how to use notation software and also in many ways how to write music. Like I remember I created my finale file and it wasn't automatically a C score. And so I would just write into it being like, I don't know why there's two sharps in the clarinet part. That's weird. But I just like wrote in it anyway, as if it wasn't. So it ended up sounding like all these parallel seconds. And <laughs> it sounded much more interesting than what, I, than what I wrote when I figured out you could put the score in C. <laughs> but like, I basically taught myself transpositions that way because I was like, oh, but if I write the clarinet stuff as a whole step higher, it sounds right. But I press play in the MIDI. And then I learned like, oh, if you write things in the Saxon parts as if they're bass clef, it's the right pitches, things like that. Um, and I didn't have any sort of formal composition lessons, but I was really fortunate when I did go to Lasseter as a high school student that I was, in, I was a part of such a great music program um, to where I was like, I almost didn't need a composition teacher just because I was exposed to so much music and so many good musicians, either people I went to school with or um, guest artists they would bring in um, to where I felt like I had a really good like just foundation as a musician from going to Lasseter. Um, and I was in marching band. I was in pit for four years and went to lots of fun parades and um, trips and things like that to where most of my friends were in band. And it's where I really found like my place as a high school kid. Um, and I guess later on as a person, <laughs> as a musician professionally. Um, yeah, I, you know, this is, I, we, I talk about this a lot about band being community and band being a, a sort of, a gives a lot of kids, a an identity, especially, you know, in junior high and high school. I know for me, it was that way. I know that that's where my friends were and that's where I felt comfortable. You know, when I was at my most vulnerable times, that's kind of where I would hide the band room, the band teacher, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's where I ate lunch <laughs> <laughs> growing up. I never felt like I fit in anywhere. Um, I was usually the only Asian kid in class. Um, I was very quiet, very shy. I didn't make friends very easily. And so it's like kind of ironic and like a, in marching band of all things, like in a sea of shakos and uniforms, like where you're all supposed to kind of blend in with each other that you feel like you can actually be yourself. Um, and I 100% like credit music and band to as the place where I felt like I could be myself and where I could really grow into the person I would become and things like marching band leadership, they like obviously help, but, um, just having a place where you felt like you could always go, like the band room was where you could eat lunch, you could hang out with your friends, you could practice, you know? Um, and I remember some of those marching room practices, just not wanting them to end. Like I didn't want to go home and like, face reality and do my homework and stuff. Cause band was like the place where you could feel like a, like a rock star of, mm. all, of all places, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know exactly what you're saying. And I think a lot of my listeners, this resonates with them even now, you know, I, I'm really happy with what I have in my life. I'm successful as a teacher and I have my, a wonderful wife and family and my kids and, and everything seems to be going fine, but I still look forward to going to the community band and, and playing my trumpet in that setting, because there's something about being in a band and playing in an organization or an ensemble that's, that's special and different than almost anything else I do. That's something I definitely miss. Um, it feels weird to be like on the other side of that as a composer now, uh, to be looking <laughs> upon the ensemble. Um, 
But I think band is always a place that it's kind of self-selecting in ways like the kids who make it to high school band. Um, they all kind of feel this way to a certain extent and they enjoy, they enjoy being with others. Yeah. Generally good people. Not everybody, but generally good people. Oh yeah. I'd say like, I, I've always like places like Midwest are always fun because everyone's like, like equally geeky and <laughs> wonderful yeah. in that way. Um, and so, yeah, I've always, I always, I have a very um, special place in my heart for the band world. And that's why I continue to write for band. So ta- tell me about Lassiter. That's one of the legendary programs. That's uh, Mr. Alfred Watkins. Uh, what was that experience like beyond the, the what we've already talked about? What was he like? It was amazing. I mean, and I, the thing is, when you go to a school like Lassiter, you like, it's just, oh, it's just the high school. It's the place where my parents happen to move. <laughs> like the school district were zoned in. And like, you know, like you you get there like as a freshman and you like see the big like two-time national champions thing written everywhere. And then you see like all these pictures and frames when you walk in um, into the band building there. And there's like pictures of the Macy's Parade. There's pictures of like their Midwest performances in the past. They're... Um, music for all performances, all these things. And um, you feel like you're uh, like, I don't know, you don't feel pressure to be like great or anything, but you just feel like I want to be like awesome. Like all these past, like previous students were, you know? Um, And that's something that just was instilled in everyone in band. It was like, you just try your hardest and it'll be worth it, you know? and I just, I love being in band there. And I mean, all the things they say about Alfred Watkins are true. <laughs> he's just like, he's just like such a supportive, he's always been a, such a supportive mentor to me. Um, and just the, I feel like you learn a lot from just um, being in the midst of a great leader, you know? And he's definitely that. Do you have one thing that he taught you that you still carry with you that you can put your finger on? You know, I feel like it wasn't just one thing he did, but he always tried to make great opportunities for his students. And it could could come in many different forms, you know. Sometimes those great opportunities were like taking us to a BOA regional where we would like work our hardest. And um, there are other times where it would just be like, a great opportunity would just be to take us to like the beach together as a band and we would bond that way. Um, And sometimes it's bringing really great guest artists. Um, Like I remember my uh, sophomore year of high school, um, our percussion, our concert percussion ensemble went to Midwest. It was my first experience with Midwest and, um, I think ultimately Mr. Watkins had like the, the say in what like guest artists and things, even though our great percussion teachers, um, Mike Lynch and Scott Brown, they brought in like Tim Adams to perform with us, Michael Burt to perform with us and just things like that. It's like to expose us to things outside of our Marietta, Georgia band world, you know, um, those are really inspiring for me, especially like the first time going to Midwest, <laughs> obviously for any kid. Um, and yeah, and I mean, also, he was very supportive and, like, played through the music, that this horrible music I wrote back in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, having experiences like that, it, it was amazing, you know? What do you think um, band directors can do to help support young composers who are, are in their bands? I think there's a lot you can I mean, one thing you can do is just play the music that they're writing. And let me tell you, speaking from my own experience, it's not going to be good music most of the time. <laughs> But just like being very supportive and like, and just like being excited there with the young composer and also being just like supportive for when they're really horrified. Cause just, especially when you're like a 15 year old kid, you know, and there's like 50 people playing something with your name on it. Like, um, you don't ever feel as exposed as that, right? <laughs> like you, you feel like you're basically naked in front of everyone. That um, never goes away, does it though? 
<laughs> no, it doesn't. But especially when you're 15. Like, yeah, sure. And so just like getting all the students excited about it too and getting everyone on the same page. But then also maybe just like um, giving good listening recommendations um, and opening up your like scores to the composers so they can look at the score and listen at the same time. Um, like I remember Mr. Watkins and also um, Catherine Sanon Bushman. I just knew her as Miss Sanon back then. <laughs> um, but they would they would just load me scores and they would give me those like teaching music through performance CDs. And so I would just go home and like listen to all the CDs and um, try to find scores for them and just expose myself to all that music. So I knew a lot of band music in high school, but I'd say for like a any band directors now who are who maybe have a young com like composer in their midst, like try to give them recommendations like outside of the band world as well, because um, that can be just as eye opening, obviously. One of the things you're talking about the reaction of the director and the teacher. It's so important that it's a positive reaction because it also models the reaction of the peers too. Yeah, and so yeah. you know you don't want to show the band that it's you want to support people who are writing music. Yeah, I think that's like probably something better to think a lot about. I mean, I wouldn't know, but like, <laughs> just if you're in a good mood, it's like contagious, just as much as if you're in a bad mood, that's contagious too. Um, so like, I guess a lot of being a band director is kind of having to act even when you don't feel like the most cheery person, but trying to convey that anyway. Well, the old teacher thing is that everything that happens in the classroom, is good or bad, comes from you. Yeah, I can. I definitely can see that, and I'm glad I don't have to do that. But <laughs> I have a lot of respect for band directors who do that on a daily basis. All right, Viet. So let's talk about what happened next. So you have you're you're in your doctoral studies. Can you tell me sort of the the transition from high school to university and and how you became a composer and decided that composition was a thing you wanted to do? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I guess it is because of the band world that I knew that being a composer was a thing that a living person could do. Um, just because I, I used to like sit on JW Pepper and look at their new releases and be like, oh, who are the composers these days who are writing new music? Um, so I always knew it was a thing you could do. Um, I didn't know like anything else like about how they got there, how much money they made, like if it was like a thing you could live off of. Um, but I just knew I loved it and that's what I wanted to do. But I'd never had like a formal composition lesson before um, I got to college. But I basically was like, I went on the internet and I, I guess at that time it was uh, Yahoo <laughs> instead of Google. But I, like I searched um, like music composition college programs and I started to put together like a list of schools. Um, but either had teachers I was interested in studying with or that maybe I had just heard of. Um, and I put together this portfolio of three pieces that I had no live performances of or recordings. They were all MIDI and it was like MIDI back in 2007. <laughs> um, but I like made a CD and printed out the scores. I didn't know what an 11 by 17 score was at the time. So I was like, had this big band piece on legal size paper. <laughs> um, and, but, you know, I applied to some schools and I was accepted to some of them. And I ended up going to Peabody, um, Peabody Conservatory, just like the music school of Johns Hopkins um, in Baltimore. And I remember I wanted, I, I heard, I found out what Peabody was because I was at this governor's honors program, this like summer program where I was a percussion major uh, in Georgia. And a summer before I was applying to schools and one of our teachers was teaching a class on like 20, 21st century music. And they played a piece called Rainbow Body by, by this composer, Chris Theophanius. Yeah. And I thought it was just like the most amazing piece. So I, Googled him and then his name came up and said he taught at Peabody, so I applied to Peabody. And I ended up going to Peabody to study with Kevin Putz, um, who was an amazing, amazing teacher. It's like he'll always have, like hold a special place in my heart as well, just because he was like my first composition teacher. Uh-huh. Um, Good place to start, Viet. Yeah. I mean <laughs> 
Well, I like to say that I, I, I was a student of his before he won the Pulitzer Prize so before he was cool, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he was an amazing teacher, just an amazing person, very supportive, and um, always just it was very encouraging for me just to write the music I wanted to write, but also um, gave me great listening re- recommendations. And um, I don't know if I thought about this at the time, but I think it was like a really good thing for me to go to a place that wasn't a big band school. Um, because Peabody has a great band ensemble. It's a good, I mean, it's all music majors, so Peabody, um, but it like the focus there is so much more on orchestra. Um, and I just, it was like, I remember the first time, like Kevin Post was like, oh, you should listen to like Prokofiev's like Fifth Symphony. And I'd never heard that before. I like barely knew who Prokofiev was. <laughs> um, and just, I felt like, my whole world was like opened up so much in the first couple weeks of school, just like being friends with like violinists and like my roommate was a violinist and talked about like Dvorak, you know, these, these uh, composers that like I knew of, but I didn't really know of their music very much, very well. Um, and just my, I feel like my ears are opened up so much by going to a school that wasn't where the focus wasn't, what I had focused on as a musician for so many years. Yeah. And so one of the things that you and I briefly talked about before um, I started to record was that, you know, my experience as in my doctorate, I went to a big band school. I went to Florida state for my doctorate and, um, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't involved much with writing for band. My first piece there was, but I was much more, I married a cellist and I was much more involved in chamber music and orchestral music and, and, and that. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt like, and now I'm going to be careful how I say this. I always feel like there's a little bit of tension between the academic slash avant-garde new music community and mm-hmm. sort of the school band, commercial band world. And I and I, I say that kind of carefully because I, I, mean, I don't want to overdo this, but did you feel that? Do you feel that tension? Yeah, I mean, I will say that like when you're, as, as a composer, you're like going through your schooling, there's like kind of a track that a lot of composers take. Um, like you go your undergrad and then um, like after I finished my grad, I just applied to grad schools right away. Um, I was like extremely lucky, grateful to have gotten into Princeton for that. Um, and you know, it's funny. I was like, I was at this music festival a couple years ago. Like I had a, piece being performed like premiered there and another composer who i won't say their name but um they're very well-known composer who does band music and um chamber orchestral stuff as well and they like pulled me aside and started just kind of talking to me um and it's really interesting conversation but one point they said like but you don't write band music (laughs) um because they knew i went to princeton and uh i was like oh i I have a couple band pieces um and they were like kind of shocked that someone who went to princeton would have any sort of career in the band world um and i just found that kind of funny but also kind of telling about how there is kind of this divide, not just like between different like subgenres in our field, but also like between different institutions. Um, how like, oh, if you're a composer at like Michigan or USC or UT or something, you're like expected to write band music or something. But I know many composers who've been to those schools that don't write band music. Yeah, no, that wasn't my experience at Florida State. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then how... Um, like a composer at Princeton or Columbia or Yale, like, oh, you don't write band music because you're you're fully in the new music community, like you're New York or something. But like, that's not really true either. Um, and I feel like, and if I, the thing is, I do feel like at a place like Princeton, there just there's like a tremendous diversity in what the composers there and the grad program write. And I thought, and I think it's just like an amazing thing. Um, and it's really pushed me to try new things. And I hope that I bring something unique to the program as well. Um, 
and and actually like one of my uh roommates in grad school really amazing composer named amanda fury i saw that she won this uh thing with ball state to write a piece for them so like that's amazing just to see that like uh someone else at princeton writing a band piece and i hope maybe like <laughs> that me right working on moth when i was rooming with her like <laughs> maybe like uh uh maybe made us think like oh maybe i can write a band piece too even though she came from the band world too so probably not but. i don't know if my <laughs> listeners i all appreciate sort of the history of princeton's composition program and what what that means in the composition world and its history i mean this is milton babbitt and you know <laughs> this is uh sort of the most avant-garde of the places i guess is how do i want to say that yeah, but the thing is, nowadays it's totally not like that. Oh, I know, but it has that, you know, once that reputation is, it's like first impressions. Oh, yeah. And you know what's so funny is, like, I, I remember I went to, like, my first couple lessons at Princeton, and I was like, these teacher studios are so small. Like, it's just like a desk. <laughs> and I remember they had, like, Louis Andreessen as, like, a guest teacher for a semester. Like, they had to give him a bigger room because... <laughs> But then I remember like being, thinking like, wow, these are really small rooms. And then I later found out it's because when they were designing the building, it was Milton Babbitt was the like head honcho there. And he didn't want the rooms to be big enough to have a piano because it was all in your head, not in your, by your ears, right? <laughs> oh, that is like the most Babbitt <laughs> so thing rooms, ever. <laughs> yeah. And so none of the rooms could fit a piano. And that, that's why when Louis Andreessen came, he like insisted that he had like a real piano in his studio so they gave him a bigger room <laughs> i just thought that was kind of funny um because it's, now it's like totally not like that i'm sure milton babbitt's rolling in his grave that like i'm a student at princeton <laughs> <laughs> and you know, but, he, uh, he didn't anticipate finale and computers yeah but you know may he rest in peace but um i, I don't think he would have really been into my music <laughs> Yeah. So let's talk about your music because, you know, I first heard your name and, and you came across my radar when I first heard the moth a few years ago and it's an extraordinary piece. And so can you oh, tell you. everybody about your, your band compositions and what you're doing? Yeah. Um, like I, like, as you've probably figured out now, I, I love band and, um, continue to write for it, but I, I also like to write for other things cause I feel like they kind of, um, help push me into new places musically. But um, my band pieces, I um, I usually try to do something different in terms of orchestration, I guess mainly orchestration. Um, but uh, in my band music, I really love to try to create like, um, like atmospheres that you don't normally associate with band music. Um, and usually this is done with orchestration. Um, I remember in undergrad, uh, even though Peabody wasn't really like a, a band school, um, this great composer, Joel Puckett, which I'm sure you know, who I'm sure you know, um, he was my theory teacher at Peabody. And so I got to kind of see the band world from his perspective. Um, and he's an amazing orchestrator for band and taught this um, class on orchestrating for band, I was at Peabody. And it was really great just to be able to like, um, learn orchestration for band from like a more modern perspective. Um, I remember I actually, a little trivia, I made the set of first set of parts for the Shadow of Sirius' Flute Concerto. Um, I don't know why you trusted me to do that, but I, I remember he sent me the score and I was like, what is this? This is so different than like any other band music I've heard before. And so I feel like um my orchestration has grown a lot just from that and then also just like writing other music um for orchestra and chamber music as well um i like whenever i orchestrate for band i like it to sound like as if on the piano you have a pedal and you press on the pedal and everything rings i like to think of orchestrating for band as if there is a big old pedal under the band that you press and it makes everything ring and like hold on a little longer. Yeah. That effect. So do you do a lot of, um, sort of pyramid kind of orchestrations where things are holding over each other? Yeah. That, and just try to blur things. I remember when I wrote moth, um, 
I remember I uh, got an email from Jeff Ball, the conductor in Brooklyn Symphony. He said, like, oh, I heard your piece Sound and Smoke, and I really like it, and we're going to Midwest with the Brooklyn Symphony, and I want you to write the closer for the concert. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I just remember thinking, like, okay, Midwest, like, it's not the ideal acoustic space, right? It's a big ballroom. It's carpeted. It's, like, it exposes everything that I don't necessarily like about the band, how it can sound. <laughs> And so I was like, okay, I want it to sound like, I want this to sound like it's in Carnegie Hall, even if it's in this ballroom at McCormick Place. <laughs> so this is the way I orchestrated certain things in that. Um, I tried to make it sound very reverberant and sparkly. And, um, and I, I'm really proud of that piece. Um, just the whole experience of that. And the fact that someone trusted me as like a 22 year old to write a finale for a Midwest concert is kind of still... I don't understand it. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad they did. It's a great piece. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it was a really great experience, and working with like a community band like that from Brooklyn, where everyone's just so enthusiastic and also like really good at playing their instruments. So, tell me about you know most of your music is for advanced concert band. You know what we'd consider grade five, grade six. Um, I do notice you have a couple younger pieces. Yeah, uh, I have one that I wrote. A couple years ago, a couple years ago, called Diamond Tide. Um, that was written for um, a group of middle schools in Austin, led by Cheryl Floyd. Um, and I remember when I first looked up Cheryl Floyd, I was like, "Oh wow, she's like commissioned a lot of like like big pieces for this grade level, like Cajun folk songs, I think." <laughs> and so I was like really excited about it and I'm really proud of that piece too just because I feel like I didn't sacrifice any of who I was even though I was writing for middle school and that was really hard to kind of um kind of shift to writing for an easier grade level even though that piece is still not easy necessarily but <laughs> did but, um did eight minutes at that grade level raise any eyebrows not really I think it's because the movements can be form performed separately um, some people do just the first movement, which I'm particularly proud of. Um, just the colors in that movement. And um, so I, I, I don't think it raised any eyebrows, actually. I, I think more just in general, the overall group, like certain things in the piece raised eyebrows, but um, it all worked out. And I love um, like how just enthusiastic middle schoolers are about like me a composer and it's something you don't like experience all the time with professional like groups, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. They're fun. So, yeah. Have you thought about writing anything even younger, like a grade two? Well, um, this composer collective, I'm in the blue dot collective. We're doing like a group commission where each of us is going to write a minute. So this will be like six little miniatures for grade one. Yeah. I'm a little terrified, but <laughs> It's all gonna be good. It's gonna be good. Don't be terrified. <laughs> yeah, and but it's I you know I I will say like part of me feels like this kind of obligation to write the best music I can for younger grade levels, just because that's where you can make an impression, um, and you want their experience in band to be the best it can be, and part of that is having playing music that's the best music that you can write. I there's quite a learning curve for to write for young band. I remember the first time I tried to write a young piece, it was way too hard. Yeah, I'd say that's what Diamond Tie was. <laughs> but it's still a lot easier than Moth or Sound and Smoke. So um one of these days I'll get like a true grade two and a half, three piece that will still feel like sophisticated to me, but just easier to play. It's hard to so, do. It's hard to do. Yeah, I mean like people hate on a lot of this younger van music, but at some point it's like, it's just really hard to write. So I have a lot of respect for people who do it on a consistent basis. Like who can, who can write music pieces that sound different, mm -hmm. but still sound like them. It's like extremely difficult to do. And I wouldn't want to do it for <laughs> like every year or anything. So kudos to those people who do. We have to inspire kids. We have to have give them the music that makes them want to keep playing so they can get to the point where they can play something like the moth. So everyone has yeah. to start somewhere. 
Yeah, and you want them to stick with it too. They, they all start with hot cross buns in the first couple months. And to think you're and to think you're like above it or something is kind of frustrating. I just I I think I've always I was always and still I am drawn to like writing more difficult pieces just because I have these kind of ideas for things that um, in some ways are easier to achieve with a more difficult <laughs> grade level. So, you know. And do you have any advice that you would give to a, a composer, maybe someone who's listening who wants to get into composition? Yeah, I think my biggest piece of advice, actually I have two things, if I can <laughs> say two things. Um, one thing is just to always like, try to listen to something or some composer that you didn't think you would like. Um, Cause even, and you could probably, you'll probably listen to it and then your dislike of it will be reaffirmed, but just like try, try to push yourself to um, open up your ears to things. Um, because like I said, like going to like a, going to college where band wasn't the focus was a huge kind of, inspiring thing for me to do and i think that's why if anything i still like to write for band because i don't feel like burnt out on it um and i feel like doing writing for other ensembles um has really pushed my band music forward um so that's my first piece of advice and then second is to not rush um and to how do I say this? Like, there's a difference between being ambitious and like, um, I don't know if there's a word for it, but just like putting yourself out there too soon, if that makes sense. Because when you're in school, you know, that's like the safe place where you can like write pieces that totally don't work, that sound awful, when you don't want them to sound awful, and you know, where you can take risks and grow as a composer. And I think for some young composers, they really want to get out there like really soon and like hit the ground running. And I applaud that. And I, I don't think ambition is ever a bad thing, but just know that like the music you put out there is like kind of out there forever in certain ways. And you don't want to look back in 10 years and be like, man, I really wish that piece, the little concert fanfare wasn't out there, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, and it's a balancing act because I don't know if anyone will ever truly feel ready to, you know, be out there in the world because I almost feel like I'm always perpetually unhappy with like what I'm writing in certain ways. I'm like, I'm simultaneously happy, but then I always feel like I could do better. Um, so I always kind of feel that way, but like, just don't rush into getting your career started and everything. Like there's always time. Um, but yeah, just uh, I think you always you'll you'll know when it's like the right piece that you want to put out there. Um, but just know it's like it's a it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, that's that's really good advice. Life is long. We tend to forget that when we're young. Yeah, well, we don't know it yet when we're young. Yeah, and I think in the, also in the classical music world, there is kind of this obsession with like the young oh, yeah. chin sort of thing, you know, and. I, I'm sure that I have benefited from that in some way <laughs> in the past, but uh, just uh, it's not, it's at the end of the day, the music is what speaks for itself, regardless of how old you are or anything. So if you write music that connects with people and is compelling in some way, then it'll get out there. Um, not really. There's no use in like rushing sure, to sure. that. So you, you mentioned a couple things and I, I used to have the, a lot of discussion about commercial publishing versus self-publishing. And I've sort of gone away from that a little bit, but one of the things that, um, I think it was just mentioned on a recent episode is that when you're commercially published, you know, your early works are always out there Yeah, if they were published. And one of the benefits of being self-published is that you can kind of remove works from your catalog whenever you want <laughs> Yeah. You know, and I, I found yeah. myself doing that over the years. It's just kind of purging all these works that don't really represent who I am anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's definitely a nice thing about self-publishing. Among the other many benefits of self-publishing, that's definitely one of them. You can kind of control what gets out there and what doesn't. And um, even not just that, but like, I remember um, I'm doing this artist diploma right now um, at Curtis and uh, 
Jennifer Higdon, who's one of the absolute masters of self-publishing and just in our field in general as composer, but she um, gave a talk with her wife and business partner um, on kind of the uh, the ins and outs of self-publishing. And one thing that I didn't even think about was like, or a couple of things, like if a publishing house goes under, so does your piece, like it's kind of gone. But also like a publishing house can give your music to whoever they want and say like maybe some politician that you are not that does, who does not align with your views at all wants to use your music for like some sort of thing they can do it if it's not if you given the rights away so um definitely the whole being able to control what gets out there is an, a great thing for self-publishing mm-hmm. yeah no i there's there's great things about self-publishing but there's also good things about being commercially published i mean it's sort of a balance you have to you have to do some calculus in your head about what what you want from that particular piece of music and what your expectations are yeah definitely um and i think at some point there could there could be a point where i write a piece that it makes sense to have it published but um for now i've been really happy with um, self-publishing so. so tell me about the blue dot collective uh huh. Yeah. So it's basically uh, this is our we just finished our third year, um, and it's great. Um, I think the great thing about it is we're all kind of in different parts of the band world. We all have some overlap, but like a lot of times it's like, oh, I've heard of this and this person, but I haven't heard of this and this person. Um, so it's just a good way to kind of um, to share our music um, more broadly. And I think also going forward, I feel like we're all getting to a place where we feel like we have some sort of, um, we have more reach than we, than we used to. Um, and so we have kind of a, a platform to have an impact and make a difference and in terms of mentorship and whatnot. So I think we have some things that we're trying to do to uh, encourage young musicians and especially young composers. So who are the other composers in the collective? Uh, it's, me, Dave Biedenbender, um, Jennifer Jolly, Ben Taylor, Jess Turner, and Roger Zare. All amazing composers that you should check out. Blue.collective.com. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll link it in the show notes for sure. Yeah. Um, and it's just fun, too, because we're all just friends as well. And Midwest could be an overwhelming thing, but kind of being... Um, in it with other people who you're friends with is always makes it really fun. So counting down the days we we're, we're early January. We're like two, 325 days or something. <laughs> yeah. But let me just say that sneaks up on you. <laughs> like November rolls around and you're like, Oh, we need to get things ready for our booth. And like this year we had a clinic that we did. Um, so it was a lot of, uh, stuff like little things too like oh when you get this banner printed you need to do this and that <laughs> so but yeah so i think we'll probably have a booth at midwest from now on so that's always fun it's always nice to be at the booth and people walk up and you see their name tag and can put a face to the nate that you mailed an order to or something <laughs> where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music i think in a world where things are competitive where there's like it seems that there aren't like enough opportunities to go around for everyone, even though I don't know if that's necessarily true um, to feel competition. But I think, you know, we're like all in this together and the, we just need to support each other, you know? And sometimes that supporting each other can come in ways of like, like feeling some sort of healthy competition. Like, Oh, this person wrote a really great piece. Like, I want to write a really great, great piece too, you know, and like, I know I have it in me, so I'm going to do that. Um, and just making it all about the music and not about like, oh, this person got this or that. And like, I deserve that. And I was like, no, like they really, they wrote a really great piece and you can write a really great piece too. And in many ways that pushes you to do the best you can do. Um, so I think healthy competition comes just when it's like, um, making about the music and um, and just knowing that you can do the best you can because other people are doing it. All right, Viet. So as a composer and as a student and as a musician, how do you achieve a work-life balance? 
I don't know if I can answer that because I, like I, I struggle with that because um, I want to take on as many projects as I can reasonably take on. Um, but obviously, the more you write, the less you live um, a normal life, <laughs> I guess. So um, it's a hard thing to balance. I don't know if I've quite figured it out, but um, it's something I think a lot about more, especially as I'm finishing school. And because when you're in school, it's like almost like the work life balance is work. <laughs> you know, it's like I feel like, oh, I need to like work as learn as much as I can, write as much as I can. And that's like part of being in school. But like when school ends, it's kind of like, oh, well, maybe I can, you know, not think about music 100 percent of the day, you know. Um, and so I'm figuring that out and check back with me in a couple of years. I might, I might figure it out by then. What are the challenges facing music education and band and how can we best meet them? I think just like making band, continuing to make band a place where like everyone feels welcome is really important because I know how much I benefited from that. And I think even for, not just for kids who don't end up becoming a musician, but making it like feel like everyone is equally important and equally vital to the success of the program you know and i think that's the great thing about music is like everyone is contributing something right it's not like this thing where it's like in a math class everyone takes their tests and like everyone's like kind of there and does their own individual thing band is all about coming together and part of that is making everyone just by like regardless of where they come from or what they look like to feel like they belong. Um, and oftentimes music is what does that for me. That's what did that. All right. So Viet, if you could go back to when you were 18 and you were graduating from high school, what would you say to yourself? What advice would you give? I think I would give myself the same advice I give <laughs> to young composers, which is to push yourself to listen to things you don't think you would like. And also to not rush because, um, I feel like when I was 18, that was like when the like rise of social media was happening. It was like right around when Facebook was becoming a thing that everyone had. And I think when you, when you feel like, like your life is kind of out there for everyone to see, you want it to be great, right? You want to have exciting things to announce and whatnot. And that makes, I feel like that goes along with feeling rushed to have this image of success. And um, I think the advice I would give myself is just don't worry about that stuff, you know? And I don't think I worried it, about it that much, but because social media back then was more of a private thing, like you had your friends that you shared things with. But now with Instagram and Twitter, where things are more a public platform, it feels like you need to have your like image or whatever. Um, and I think of ultimately your image is your, what music you're putting out, right? Not your, like how many likes you get on a Instagram post or something. So, um, so I would definitely tell myself to think about that stuff, but I think for, it's more important for like young composers now who grew up, like that's all they've ever kind of known, you know, um, to know that like social media and like, you know, uh, putting yourself out there is really important, but, um, not to feel like there's any rush to have your image or whatever. Like you don't need to be John Mackey just quite yet. <laughs> I was just thinking the other day about how Facebook has, has changed so much in the last two years or so. Yeah. In many ways, I feel like it's almost like our, the musician's answer to LinkedIn. <laughs> I was, that's exactly what I was going to say. I get friend requests from a lot of people I don't know. Oh yeah. I mean like this year, especially after Midwest, it's like, oh, I'm happy. Anyone who's listening, I'm happy to be friends with you on Facebook. But it's just like, I got like so many friend requests from people I've never met. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I, since Midwest, I probably have 200 more friends on Facebook than I did before. Yeah. Yeah. No, I feel similarly. And, and I, I always, I have a sort of a baseline rule. I always see who our mutual friends are. Yeah. I feel like you, I need to have at least like five. <laughs> or, or if there's like a picture of you like holding a trombone or something. Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah, but. yeah, 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 exactly. All right. So I don't mean this to be morbid. It's about the piece that, that you value that means something to you. So um, 
If you could plan it out, what would be the final work that you'd like to conduct or hear or interact with? I guess like this makes me even more morbid, but like Rite of Spring is like always a piece that everyone always says is the piece that made them want to be a composer. But I feel like that piece is the piece that I listened to that really like opened up my mind to possibilities. Um, and such so is a great piece. So that'd be, that would be a bad piece to be your last piece to listen to. <laughs> How about a piece of your own? If someone who doesn't know anything about you wanted to know more about your music, what would you tell them to listen to? Um, well, I guess I would say this uh, new piece I have, the uh, Renewal, it's a percussion quartet concerto. Um, it's very recent. Um, I'm actually working on a band version of it right now. But it's originally written for like a chamber orchestra plus percussion quartet. And then in the fall, I made a full orchestra version and now I'm making the last version it's just going to be a band version um and I feel like that piece really speaks to where I am right now as a composer um and I'm really excited about the band version because it's going to be really fun I was just going to ask you is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote uh yes so renewal the band version will be um will be finished very soon and Brooklyn Wind Symphony, Dallas Winds and UT Austin Wind Ensemble are going to be doing it this spring. Um, and then more performances of that will be coming after that. Um, people who are part of the consortium. And also I'm finishing a tuba concerto for band and tuba that will be done very soon as well. Um, that let me just tell you, tuba concerto. <laughs> it's not the easiest thing in the world to write, but I'm pretty, I'm very proud of it. Um, and so, look out for that soon. Um, Purdue, uh, Fort Wayne, Dan Tembris is uh, kind of spearhead of the whole thing, um, and he's be premiering it soon. Um, I think UGA is doing it in later in the spring, and then. Uh, eight other schools are part of the consortia for that. So, all right. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, just through my website, vietquangmusic.com. Um, my email is on there. Um, lately, there's been a lot of emails I've had to get <laughs> uh, get through. So, but I try to respond to everything. So, you were very quick to respond to me when I emailed you. Yeah, sometimes if I'm already, yes, it's like if I'm already in email mode, if someone emails me, I will respond right away. But if I'm like working on a deadline or something, I'm not currently in the act of emailing, it could take like up to a week or sometimes longer, I'm embarrassed to say. But um, so it's, it's like where emails have become just so frequent, you know, it's like, it gives me anxiety sometimes. <laughs> All right, Viet, thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. Thanks for chatting with me. 